Hello and welcome to IR Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zupko. On this episode, I'm interested in Arctic geopolitics. Many students and many people, they are wondering how the Arctic works, how the territory is divided, who can go there and drill the oil, who can build a research station, and who, who are the players, the international actors, actually, who are interested in the Arctic. I'm joined by Professor Klaus Dotz. Hello, Klaus. Hello. Pleased to be with you. Professor Dotz is an executive dean for the School of Life Sciences and Environment and also professor of geopolitics at the Royal Holloway University of London. Klaus is also a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, Royal Geographical Society, Regional Studies Association, and many more. He also has many public positions. He's advisor to the UK Parliament. Uh, he works with NATO strategic foresight analysis and UK's DEFRA on the post-COVID futures. Klaus is very active in academic writings and on his uh, personal website, there are like 70 articles, 30 chapters of books, 15 books, some 11 other outputs and many more. His latest book, is Border Wars, The Conflicts That Will Define Our Future, published in 2022. So Klaus, welcome again. And we want to develop this episode in a very comprehensive way. So firstly, let's start with the definition. What is the strategic importance of the Arctic and how this definition of importance has been changing within the years, because we live in a very dynamic geopolitical world. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. So I, th I think that's a really good opening question to start off this reflection on the uh, current and future uh, geopolitical context uh, that shapes the Arctic. So I think we can probably break this down to three things. First of all, as a geographer, first and foremost, it's probably worth saying that the Arctic can be defined in a variety of ways, but typically we, we often use, for example, the Arctic Circle, 66 degrees north, as a starting point to say that all the land, ice, sea and airspace, if you will, beyond 66 degrees north is often assumed to be part and parcel of the Arctic region. It's important to say that because if you if you start with that opening premise, then you very quickly appreciate that around 50% of the surface area of the Arctic falls under the uh, jurisdiction of the Russian Federation. And then the rest is, is in various ways under the sovereign, sovereign jurisdiction of seven other so-called Arctic states, some very large like Canada, some small like Iceland, and of course, then we've also got other bodies of water and ice that I'm sure we'll get on to. Now, how, how has the strategic importance of the Arctic changed over time? Well, we can probably divide things up into three distinct uh, phases, if you like, over the last 70 or 80 years, just for convenience. So first, unsurprisingly, if we take that as our time frame, we have a Cold War context, and really what we could conclude is, is that for much of that period, from the late 1940s up until, say, the late 1980s, the Arctic was a highly militarized space. Russia, Soviet Union, uh, ha clearly was involved in a broader strategic confrontation with NATO allies, and the Arctic, of course, was not immune to all of that. Famously, we had nuclear-powered submarines traveling under the Arctic ice cap. And we also had, particularly in the Soviet Arctic, many areas which were simply forbidden, forbidden spaces that even Soviet citizens could not travel to. So highly militarized, highly securitized. Now, in the late 1980s, up until really quite recently, we had arguably a different kind of Arctic begin to emerge, an Arctic that was perhaps characterized more by collaboration, cooperation, a shared enthusiasm for issues that were trans-Arctic, trans if you will, such as environmental protection, search and rescue, oil spill response, 
all the things that you would expect that, you know, parties that were able to get along with one another would have shared interests in sustainable development, for example, indigenous rights. However, in more recent times, and I suppose inevitably the full-scale invasion of Ukraine is probably a good as any point of consideration, so from February 2022 onwards, we've also seen a deterioration in that collaborative, circumpolar vision of the Arctic. So what I would suggest now is that we have an Arctic that is less, unfortunately, circumpolar and collaborative, but more bifurcated. So where, for example, the Russian Federation and its enormous Arctic zone is increasingly being feted, if you will, by Asian partners, partners from the Middle East. And then we have the non-Russian Arctic, the other 50%, to put it simply, which, of course, is working to reinforce and securitize its interests. And, and of course, most notably, Finland and Sweden joining NATO, um, subject to final ratification, would probably be illustrative of that. So three phases different kinds of strategic importance, um, but one thing holds all three together, and that is simply put, those eight Arctic states that I started off with are absolutely passionate that these are really integral spaces to them, not only economically, politically, but also culturally in terms of their national identity. There is a really profound sense in which these countries and their communities, including indigenous and settler, feel very, very much that the Arctic is integral to their collective and individual sense of self. When I spoke about the Arctic during my lessons, some students ask, there is a big portion, as you said, belonging to Russia. But was it the Soviet Union that this part, you know, belonged to? And what about other states like Ukraine, Kazakhstan, you know, because Soviet Union was the group of states. So those states, they were just forgotten or how was it? It's a really good question, actually, because there's one obvious geographical response. The obvious geographical response is that if, if, if you can imagine, if you will, the 15 constituent elements of the former Soviet Union, so those socialist republics, well, at, at the heart of all of this is the enormous Russian heartland. Now, that Russian heartland stretches, of course, all the way to the west, to Arctic cities like Murmansk, and all the way to the east, for example, cities like uh, Vladivostok on the Pacific Ocean. So the vast majority of the Arctic territory, indeed the entirety of the Arctic territory of the former Soviet Union, is, is ineffectively in Russia. So simply put, geographically, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Estonia, and so on and so forth, are, lie outside that Arctic region that I talked about as potentially being definable as 66 degrees north. Now, confusingly, in Russia, in Canada and elsewhere, you also have sometimes lower latitudes, like 60 degrees north, being used to describe um, the start of the north. The Canadian north starts at 60 degrees north, for example. So there are different latitudes, if you like, lines of latitude defining the Arctic. Okay, so that's one way of answering it. Another way is to say, and this is actually an excellent point your students are making, which is, would you find, for example, Ukrainians in the Arctic? So is there another way of thinking about those connections? And the answer is yes. So, for example, in Svalbard, where the Soviet Union and subsequently Russia developed a coal mining industry, it was quite common for Russians and Ukrainians to be down in those mines excavating coal in Svalbard. So the point I think worth making is, and even today this still is true, by the way, you will still find you, some Ukrainians, probably less now post-2022, but certainly in recent times in Svalbard, and you'll also find residents of the Central Asian republics in the Russian north, 
supporting, for example, the construction of oil and gas projects up in the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation, to give it its appropriate name. So there are lots of ways in which former Soviet states like Ukraine, Estonia, are involved in Arctic business. And some of it's quite conventional, like Estonians, for example, are involved in polar research, both North and South. Do you know? So I hope that's clear. But I think fundamentally, we're talking about Russian territory. And that is, you know, in a sense, quite different, I think, from Ukraine and other um, territories, if you will, further south. Is there any influence of climate change in uh, Arctic geopolitics? And uh, just supporting question, does it, does it connect some other countries that might think, oh, you know, climate is better, let's explore? So, uh, you know, this is, this is absolutely a fundamental question. So first and foremost, and it won't take anybody who's listening to this by surprise, climate change is having a profound effect on the Arctic region. And that effect is arguably intensifying and it's having consequences that really are very, very profound. So a couple of examples. First of all, the one that many people understand, I think instinctively, the Arctic is warming and Arctic sea ice, Arctic glacial ice is shrinking, retreating, disappearing. So the Arctic Ocean, which is the one that I think a lot of um, commentators have a great deal of interest in, is unquestionably becoming a more open ocean. And that openness, I think, provokes a number of reactions. So on the one hand, for countries like Canada, it actually is disturbing, because when Arctic sea ice was very thick, it meant that the Canadian North, by definition, was less accessible because Arctic sea ice was effectively a block on movement. Now, it didn't mean, of course, that nuclear-powered submarines weren't perfectly capable of travelling up and down the Northwest Passage during the Cold War. Yes, of course, that did happen. But I think, importantly, at the surface level, if you will, key, key strategic passages like the Northwest Passage looked and felt a lot more difficult to navigate. So if you're an Arctic state, or at least a certain type of Arctic state, this is bad news, because it means that the Arctic looks and feels more accessible, and you may not care for that. Now, on the other hand, if you're Russia, and you want more commercial traffic to run along the north of the Rus Russian Federation, and the water to the north of the Russian Federation is called the Northern Sea Route, then you might think that actually less sea ice is a very good thing because on the face of it, it makes commercial shipping an easier prospect. Now, you might think all of that, and you might think that's quite instinctive and sensible. The problem is, is that actually what we're discovering is, is that it's not that straightforward. So for example, less sea ice doesn't mean no sea ice. And the Arctic, particularly in the winter, is still a very dark, cold, difficult place to operate. Second example, permafrost. So frozen ground. This is hugely important in Canada and Russia in particular, but also in other parts of the Arctic, including Alaska. If frozen ground thaws, two things happen. One, methane gas is released because that, particularly that sort of vegetative matter that had previously been frozen, is no longer frozen and it thaws. And unfortunately, methane gas emissions um, occur. That worsens um, all the concerns we have around climate change. And then the other thing that happens if the ground thaws, it means that infrastructure is no longer quite as secure as it once was. You, effectively, you get subsidence. Things start to break down. So if you're asking me, what are the geopolitical or strategic consequences of climate change? They're everything and anything in the sense of, yes, on the face of it, the Arctic might look and feel more accessible at certain times of the year in certain places. But also there is a cost factor, and that's the thing I really want to emphasize. 
So if you talk, for example, to the US Air Force in Alaska, one of the things they would tell you is that thawing ground is adding further costs to doing business in the Arctic. And that's really important to bear in mind that anything and everything in the Arctic is expensive. So climate change is putting a financial burden, a further financial burden on military, civilian infrastructure, but also it's having a very, very disruptive consequence for many indigenous communities. And we shouldn't forget that, but that's, you know, that's hugely important. And many of these communities, particularly remoter communities, are, are finding actually climate change to be deeply challenging and costly. Do those communities have any international support or, you know, there is some sort of like uns unwritten or, or, you know, some sort of unofficial agreement that, you know, Russia, Canada, all those countries, they got together, you know, and to, to try to preserve, to keep those communities in their traditional lifestyle or because of geopolitics and all those, you know, tensions, there is not much care about those people. It's a really good question, and it's a complicated question, because the other thing that's really worth saying at this stage, I've talked about the eight Arctic states, you know, from the largest, like Russia and Canada, to the smallest, like Iceland. Um, it's worth saying as well, again, just to be really clear on this, indigenous and northern communities are highly diverse, and it is, it is worth noting as well that indigenous communities across the Arctic, particularly in the last 50 years, have acquired a great deal more formal legal rights than they once had. And that means, for example, in the case of Alaska since the 1970s, they've actually enjoyed, in many cases, native communities, substantial economic and financial rights, but also in places like Canada and Greenland, um, indigenous communities have also enjoyed greater self-governance, greater autonomy, rights to subsurface resources. So it's really important to say that whatever's happening in the Arctic, indigenous peoples are highly involved in the sort of the resource governance of the Arctic. But, and then this is the big but to all of this, it is also the case that national governments can and do invoke geopolitics and security considerations to actually make decisions that indigenous peoples, northern communities would not care for. And that might be, for example, in northern Scandinavia, it might be to approve renewable energy projects that disrupt traditional reindeer herding patterns and activities. It might, in the case of Alaska, be to approve oil and gas projects that some native communities don't care for. Or it might be in the case of Russia, where the rights of indigenous peoples are arguably the weakest in anywhere in the Arctic, simply to say, we don't care, because actually the national security of the Russian Federation is by far the most important element in all of this, and resource exploitation is integral to the future of the Russian Federation. So you, you, it's a very, very mixed picture. And I think broadly put, indigenous peoples in the Russia are the, at the most precarious. How do you see the functionality of the Arctic Council? Because for some people, you know, it represents sort of like form to speak about the Arctic. And for the others, you know, it might seem as a sort of semi-governmental body, you know, sort of like some sort of the highest authority in the Arctic. So what's the situation at the moment, also with the consideration of what's going on in Ukraine? So I think it's just worth saying in terms of context, the Arctic Council was established in 1996. Um, it was uh, very much championed by Canada, and hence the reason we have the Ottawa Convention. It, the Arctic Council is an intergovernmental forum. It doesn't have the legal competency and personality that you might find, for example, uh, in and around the Antarctic Treaty, which is a very different kind of governance arrangement. So in the end, this is a forum. It's a forum of the eight Arctic states, 
And crucially, the Arctic Council gives formal representation to Indigenous peoples, and they're called permanent participants. There are also a suite of so-called observers. Those observers might be states, such as uh, Germany, the United Kingdom, China, India, but they can also be non-governmental and intergovernmental organizations. So it's quite actually, um, it's a really interesting, um, if you like, governance complex. But in the end, it's a forum. So that means that um, everything has to be done consensually, often cautiously, and the Arctic Council at its best was excellent through its working groups and task forces in considering areas of common interest. And that often meant environment, science, for example, sustainable development, you know, those kind of things, protecting the marine environment. After the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 22, and it's worth saying, by the way, that Arctic Council members were already discomforted uh, in the aftermath of the annexation of Crimea somewhat earlier, but nonetheless, they continued their collaboration. After February 22, the seven Arctic Council members, the Arctic states, declared that they were pausing their collaboration with Russia. And so now what we've seen really in the last um, year and a bit is effectively a fragmentation. So we effectively have an Arctic 7 and an Arctic 1. And, and that's obviously been quite, I think, soul-destroying for those who have been so heavily invested in what the Arctic Council was, is, and still could be, which is a platform for a circumpolar vision of the Arctic where Arctic states and peoples are able to work together in areas of common concern. So it's, we're not necessarily in a great position at the moment, and that is in, in inevitably, I'm afraid, due to the deterioration of wider relations with the Russian Federation. I think finally what I'd say is it's obviously shattered the understanding of what used to be called and still is called Arctic exceptionalism. In other words, that the Arctic was sufficiently special and regionally distinct that whatever else happened geopolitically, that, if you like, that way of doing business would prevail. Well, that's clearly been shattered um, because what we, you know, in international relations would be called the spillover effects have made themselves felt after February 2022. If we go a little bit back in time, can we say or can we assess the trajectory of, of this council in terms of competencies? So for instance, in 2021, 2020, those countries, as you mentioned, were they interested in to develop the council further or they were interested in keep it as a forum only? So th this is a really interesting question because actually um, some of the most awkward moments came actually in 2008-9, arguably, when there was growing interest from the European Union and particularly the European Parliament about the governance of the Arctic. And I think there was probably some unfortunate commentary that suggested that the Arctic was somehow short of governance. And I think it's worth stressing that when we consider the, um, the Arctic seas and oceans, we, we, no, we need to keep in mind that there is the United Nations Law of the Sea Convention. And that deals you know, with anything we might care to imagine with regards to, um, for example, sovereign rights over the Arctic seabed, international mobility, freedom of navigation. You know, the, the United Nations Law of the Sea um, Convention was a global framework for all seas and oceans, and that applies to the Arctic. And indeed, there is one special provision in what's called UNCLOS, which is uh, uh, really about ice-covered waters, but we'll put that to one side for the moment. Um, where I think some upset was caused, particularly by European parliamentarians, was the idea that somehow the Arctic states, or eight of them, didn't enjoy full sovereignty or extensive sovereign rights over the Arctic. So, of course, 
um, they would respond badly to the idea that they didn't have the sovereign authority that they do. The Arctic Council was a forum, and it was deliberately set up as a forum because the Arctic Eight jealously guard their sovereign rights and their sovereignty over, for example, in many cases, extensive land territory. And therefore, there wasn't an appetite to develop something that you might consider to be more akin to an Arctic treaty. What they have done, however, since its creation in 1996, is vastly expand the observer community. So they've invited more people to come and observe and engage the work of the Arctic Council. And actually through the work, as I said earlier, of their working group and task forces, they've actually expanded the business of the Arctic Council and supported the creation of an Arctic Economic Council to help develop things, again, things of common concern around, for example, sustainable development, economic opportunities. And the other thing worth saying, there have been some agreements signed during this period, um, for example, over search and rescue, oil spill response, scientific co cooperation in the Arctic. But that was done against the backdrop of the Arctic Council uh, and, and kind of usefully, I think, from, from their point of view, shown to be part and parcel of what was what was being uh, in essence sought to be achieved which was a more circumpolar vision of the arctic where people uh country states could work collaboratively with one another the reason why i asked that question was the, because sometimes in diplomacy especially you have the concepts and sometimes one country you know is, is doing some sort of like not not kosher things you know and then the whole concept is forgotten. And that's that's a pity, you know, because I think sometimes we have a very good concepts and because something happened or, or something, you know, is happening at the moment, we can't forget about the positives of those, of, of the, those concepts or that concept, because in the future, you know, we will start again from zero and we don't have to do this. We already have something which was developed and it worked, you know, so, so I think that's quite important to remember that despite the current situation, we should still focus on the council as, as the body. And also from the research point of view, try to develop some new ideas, because in some way we have to govern the territory. Yeah, but I mean, I think, I think, sorry, Martin, I think what I would say to that is, because that's a really good, good point you're raising. So let's, again, let's, let's be kind of clear that notwithstanding the pause in the cooperation with Russia in, in, in and around the Arctic Council, I think let's put some positives on this as well in terms of what could have happened but hasn't happened. Okay, so we've, we've got a couple of examples. Number one, um, and we haven't talked about this yet, but it's worth just mentioning quickly now, we have, of course, the Svalbard Treaty. And that's a treaty over 100 years old, um, the Soviet Union, now Russia is a signatory, as, as are many others. And essentially what Svalbard says is um, the Svalbard archipelago, the main island, Spitsbergen, which some listeners might be familiar with, is a Norwegian territory. But we have a special treaty based um, regime here where other parties enjoy equal access to resources, for example, you know, such as coal historically. Now, after February 2022, the situation could have become so parlous that Russia could have walked away from the Svalbard Treaty, and we might have been talking about a very different prevailing geopolitics in Svalbard. Thus far, that hasn't happened, and I'm not saying there hasn't been tensions between Russia and Norway over the years around Svalbard. There has, but arguably, actually, in more recent times, the greatest pressures, have, have pressures and, and divisions have been with European Union member states, such as Latvia, arguing with Norway about how fishing is regulated and controlled around Svalbard. So let's put that as a positive in terms of it hasn't happened. Another positive is that Russia, Canada, Denmark all have work to do in terms of determining how far their sovereign rights extend over the Arctic seabed. And in a nutshell, Russia, Canada, Denmark, Greenland, those, those, if you like, claims 
they overlap with one another. And thus far, Russia, Denmark, Canada are all following the international legal process that is applicable to this particular concern, and we haven't seen any deterioration in that. So that is not to say, to be super clear, that we should not be deeply concerned, alarmed about what Russia has done in Ukraine and continues to do, but it is just simply to say that actually the pausing of the Arctic Council has carried costs. You know, we don't see the scientific collaboration we once once saw the Russian Federation now, for example, but it could also have become a, a lot worse. And, and we've also got to bear in mind, whether we like it or not, that Finland joining NATO has also changed that northern flank dynamic, because previously, of course, uh, Finland and Sweden, well, yes, they were closely associated with NATO, but not formal NATO members. So again, it's not to say that we don't have a very difficult situation, but actually, to be perfectly frank, it could have been even worse. Right. So when we spoke about those tensions, um, can we define sort of primary drivers of those tensions in, in the Arctic, you know, because many people, they know something, but when I ask, like, can you define it? Mm, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, we can, we can. We can, we, can, we can say several things in terms of drivers, but I also just want to offer every, everybody listening to this a caveat. There, there are no territorial disputes in the Arctic, full stop. So if anybody thinks that, you know, Canada and Russia are arguing over vast areas of the Arctic, they're not. There are no really major contested maritime disputes um, either. Now, it doesn't mean that the US and Canada still have a bit of work to do around their shared border, but I would not describe that as a major dispute. Um, and one of the most noticeable areas of agreement was actually between Russia and Norway over the Barents Sea, and that was secured in 2010. So we do, we do have some drivers of what I might call strategic anxiety. So number one, we have concerns about accessibility and mobility in the Arctic Ocean. And to put it simply, Russia and Canada are very concerned to exercise control over who passes north of their land-based territories. So both Russia and Canada, in the case of the Northern Sea Route and the Northwest Passage respectively, care deeply about who, what, and when traverses those waters. So there is a kind of accessibility issue. And if the central Arctic Ocean, so that's the waters around the North Pole, become ever more accessible, it then leaves open the issue that others, for example, might develop a more extensive presence all over the Arctic Ocean. And that in itself is potentially unsettling. And to give you an example, it is clearly noted by Arctic states that countries like China have become ever more active in uh, things like scientific research visits in the Arctic Ocean. And so, you know, you could imagine a scenario where China, India and others become ever more present in the Arctic Ocean. And that's unsettling to Arctic Ocean states like Russia and Canada. Secondly, another driver of concern is resource development. But again, to be super clear, there are no major disputes over who owns what in the Arctic. So the, the concerns about the resource driver, if you like, are really about how do we exploit those resources? Is it economical? Do we need international partners to help us? Um, how does that, for example, sit with commitments we might have around a, um, an energy transition? And so what you see actually paradoxically in places like Alaska and Canada is you see more internal conflict and friction with sometimes indigenous communities taking different views about whether we should 
be drilling for more oil and gas, mining for more minerals. So I would argue that actually, when we think about resource drivers, sometimes the biggest tensions are within states, not internationally. However, a resource driver is also important when we think about the Russian Federation, because Russia needs international partners, Russia needs foreign investors, and, and that has been very, very obvious in the last two decades, as Russia has looked initially to the West, and now increasingly to China, India, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, for help to develop. Um, a third issue is technology and infrastructure, another driver. And just to give you an illustration of what might be at stake, so you may recall a story about an underwater cable connecting Norway to Svalbard being cut, being, being on the face of it, sabotaged. And that's a really good reminder that a big driver in all of this is around infrastructure and technology. So Arctic states worry all the time about their domain awareness. You know, do, do they know what's going on in the Arctic? Because it's very large, it's very remote, and that puts plenty of pressure on things like satellite communications, underwater uh, cables. Um, do we have, for example, sufficient assets you know, to patrol and to monitor what's going on. And that inevitably asks a lot of questions about technology and infrastructure. And there are, frankly speaking, gaps. There are just knowledge gaps, information gaps, communication gaps. A fourth thing I would, I would say is don't underestimate the indigenous northern community driver as well. You know, indigenous communities do not like being told, to put it simply, that they can't do things on the basis of either national security considerations that have been determined in Washington, Oslo, Ottawa, or on the other hand, that what is sometimes termed green colonialism trumps their interest. So typically you'll find Sami in the Nordic world saying, you know, now you're telling us we can't do things or you're interfering with our traditional lifestyles because you want to put more, for example, wind, wind energy projects up in our traditional homeland. So there's so that's another driver. That's another tension. And really what I would take away from all of this is that actually a lot of these drivers produce tensions within states rather than just always thinking of it as beyond states. So I think actually it's often the domestic geopolitics, if I can put it like that, is in some ways the most interesting. The talks, articles, and some unanswered questions about the China, especially about the Belt and Road Initiative. So what's your thought about this initiative? And the supporting question, how is this initiative received by those eight members of the Council? Yeah, it's a really important question because, you know, the other thing to bear in mind is climate change can also be another driver in the sense of if the Arctic is changing rapidly and the Arctic is having ramifications for other parts of the world, then it's not unreasonable for China and India and others to say, we have a legitimate interest in the Arctic because it's having profound consequences for us. So as some listeners will know, not so long ago, China issued a white paper and it declared itself to be a near Arctic state. Now that in itself provoked, in some cases, quite an angry reaction from Arctic states who said, well, that's ridiculous. You're not a near Arctic state. There are either, as Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State and the Trump administration said, there are Arctic states and there are non-Arctic states. There are not near Arctic states. So that, that, I think, is a good illustration that the Arctic has also become arguably a more globalized concern. So you've got a really interesting scale politics here. I would say this as a geographer. You know, you've got these very, very intense conversations and, and relationships within states. You've got it at a circumpolar level. And you've also got this very interesting interaction between a national, circumpolar, indigenous and global Arctic. So there are multiple Arctics and they kind of 
they sit alongside one another. They, they rub alongside one another. And occasionally that causes real friction. Now, China has been very clear that China considers itself to be a legitimate stakeholder. It respects the sovereignty and sovereign rights of the Arctic states and indigenous peoples, but it will not be excluded where it, it should legitimately be present. China um, has spoken about a polar silk road repeatedly, and China has sought in particular to develop closer relationships with smaller Arctic states, notably Iceland, for example, Finland, um, uh, as you know, it's probably two prominent ones. Now, some of that relationship building is, is in ways that wouldn't surprise anybody. So, for example, you know, if you were to find yourself in northern Scandinavia, you would see no shortage of Chinese tourists uh, looking to the skies with eagerness to to hunt for the northern lights, for example. And I've I've had many occasions where I've been in the Nordic Arctic in the winter and, you know, large numbers of Chinese tourists. And that's been brilliant, actually, for those Nordic communities in terms of supporting and sustaining local employment and economic opportunities. So we shouldn't underestimate that, actually, that often this is very, very welcome. Now, what's changed over the last couple of years um, is that that enthusiasm amongst Nordic states for Chinese investment and engagement has dropped markedly. And I think that's been a wider issue again, and we see it, by the way, in the United Kingdom, a growing concern that in our haste to do business with China, we might have actually left ourselves more exposed and vulnerable to Chinese investment and infrastructure and other um, key sectors than we would care for. So it's quite striking now that actually there's been a bit of a turn away from China. So it's really important to recognize that when Russia and China found each other, if you will, in Arctic investment terms, that coincided not only with a turn away from Russia, but also increasingly in the West, at least, a wariness about whether we wanted more Chinese investment um, in, in particularly Arctic territories. So, so I think that's important to say as a caveat that China is not going away. China is a very powerful um, polar scientific presence as well. And China will continue to make its presence felt in the Arctic. But for now, it is more likely to be concentrated in the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation. So I think, I think there has been a shift. And I think that enthusiasm for engagement with China in the North um, has definitely changed. So China must be finding some other ways how to penetrate the Arctic, because I think so-called a Russian container means in proper English joint venture is one of the ways, but uh, still, you know, they need technology, they need some sort of background and support. It's not that easy as people think, you know, oh, I'm going to Arctic because, you know, I can. So we spoke about the states and now the interesting question for my students, is there any non-state actor or you know a significant international player that is not a state, so it might be also the institution, actively involved in the Arctic? I, I, I'm going to give you two examples to answer that really important question. Um, so the answer is yes, and the two I'll offer um, to give contrast are these. So first, I would draw attention to the European Union that has become increasingly interested in the Arctic. And I think after what I would consider to be a bit of a, a misstep in 2008-9, when it, through its parliament, I think asked probably careless questions about the state of Arctic governance, has subsequent to that, I think developed quite a professional uh, and in, to my mind, sensible approach to the Arctic, so much so that there have been various Arctic frameworks, policies, strategies. And we've had, for example, um, EU ambassadors at large, um, who I think have actually played a very positive role in terms of highlighting, quite reasonably, in my opinion, the, um, the, the sort of the competencies and the engagement that the European Union has by its sheer presence 
in Arctic affairs. Two obvious things would be Arctic, Arctic fisheries. Um, and another would be the really very large amounts of funding the European Union offers to Arctic, indeed polar science. So I think if, you know, if your students are interested in the complex governance of the Arctic, we shouldn't underestimate the impact of the European Union. And I think that presence um, and, and presencing will, will, will grow rather than shrink. And it's particularly pertinent, of course, to what we might consider to be the European Arctic. OK, so that's one. Another, I think, I draw attention to might be um, non-governmental organisations. And we, we, could, we could have a variety of examples, but, you know, we could look at things like environmental organisations like Greenpeace. And we could say, well, one of the interesting elements of Arctic politics is the involvement of campaigning groups, for example. And, and sometimes those campaigning groups have worked sympathetically with indigenous peoples and communities to raise um, issues of common concern. And, or sometimes they have worked less sympathetically um, with indigenous groups in particular. So to give you a good example, um, it is quite common in Arctic communities for um, various species to be hunted and cult and and um, cultivated for both food, but also for financial financial reasons. And so, for example, um, indigenous communities might hunt polar bear, they might might hunt seal, whale, and that sometimes comes into conflict between with environmental campaign groups who want to stop polar bear hunting, stop whaling, stop sealing, ban exports of these products. So I think it's a, it's a good example, um, even if it causes a great deal of irritation in indigenous communities, of another actor making itself felt in Arctic governance and Arctic politics more generally. And it's just a it's just a reminder that if you look at the Arctic Council observer community, and that's what I'd say to your students, have a look who's an observer to the Arctic Council, because that gives you tremendous clues as to how the governance of the Arctic is is quite a congested one. There are quite a lot of interested stakeholders it goes well beyond the eight Arctic states and the indigenous peoples. One of the most discussed topics uh, today is energy security. Mm -hmm. Do we have any research outputs about the meaning of the Arctic for renewable energy and for the fossils, for oil and gas? Because I see some activities of the companies, but you know, the question is logical because the Arctic is far away from, let's say, Europe or Canada, you know. Is it even possible to establish some energy links with the Arctic, or it's going to be just a, a territory from where we will extract the resources? So I think it's I think it's important to say that when it comes to Arctic energy, um, we do have, for example, um, estimates that are, are are published yearly um, by various international and national bodies. Um, such as the IEA, um, and they produce their own fact sheets that will tell interested readers about why Russian oil and gas is so important to the Russian Federation. Um, and also we've had in the recent past surveys, for example, by the US Geological Survey that um, give us uh, estimates uh, of key things like oil and gas and, and will you know, make educated judgments about what we might consider to be uh, discovered and undiscovered potential. Now, the key thing to say about all of this is you will sometimes read, you know, the Arctic possesses X amount of oil, X amount of gas, so much coal, diamonds, uranium, whatever. And I, I think it's really, really, you know, important to take the caveat in mind, which is this, is just because something exists does not mean it's commercially, politically, legally sensible, permissible to exploit it. Um, so what you often find in discussions about energy 
is that there's quite a lot of hyperbole, speculation, exaggeration, that the Arctic is this straightforward energy treasure house just waiting to be exploited. Again, I said this earlier, but it's worth saying again, doing business in the Arctic, any business is expensive and time consuming. It's not straightforward. Um, and it requires a lot of investment in things like infrastructure, technology transfer, um, transport to market. So, so that's, I think it's really important to kind of note all of that. Um, beyond that, however, um, it is also true that Arctic states are very mindful of the fact that where they can sensibly develop renewable energy projects, they will do so because, for example, many Arctic communities, places like Alaska, are often critically dependent on diesel, diesel generators for their power. And there have been cases when that capacity has fallen short, or, for example, where ships have not been able to resupply remote Arctic communities, so leaving them actually quite vulnerable to effectively no, no power supply. And that's no laughing matter in the depth of an Arctic winter, which might be minus 40 degrees, minus 50 degrees. You know, that's a really serious problem. So I think what you'll find is that a lot of the conversation increasingly is about how do we improve energy resilience in these Arctic communities? How do we move them on to where it's sensible, renewable energy? Wind energy, for example, might be more sensible than solar energy um, or bi biomass, for example, might be another resource. But it, it is, it's, not, it's not straightforward. And then the other thing just worth saying, just to kind of remind everybody that the Arctic is also in places heavily urbanized. So if you're thinking of the Arctic as just lots of small little communities, that's quite wrong. Um, you know, you also got to bear in mind there are plenty of cities, towns, and depending on where you are in the Arctic, the, the north of Norway, for example, the north of Sweden or Finland, is at one level little different to the south of those countries. You know, it's only when you get into the vast Arctics of Canada, uh, Russia, Greenland, for example, then it's it's perfectly fair to say these these are profoundly different communities. But even in the Russian Arctic, you can often you can often talk about towns, whereas in the in the Canadian Arctic, you might be talking about really very very small, comparatively isolated communities. And that's where energy resilience, I think, really makes itself felt or lack of. Let's put it that way. The last question for today's interview. I know that you've been researching the Arctic for, for many years. What is the most important unanswered question when it comes to geopolitics and the Arctic for you that you are thinking about it, you are researching about it, and the question is getting either more complex or more complicated? Uh, that, that's, it, that's such a good question. Um, I'll give you two things that I'm kind of really interested in, and I I don't know how it's going to play out. So the first one is, is will Greenland become independent in my lifetime? And if it does become independent in my lifetime, and this is when I should tell listeners I'm in my mid-50s, to give you a kind of clue, um, if it does become independent, what might then follow uh, if it decides to part company with the Kingdom of Denmark? And, you know, one could imagine a series of geopolitical scenarios, um, some of which may not be welcomed by the people of Greenland. OK, so that might be one. The other one, which I think is more immediate, that's really kind of intriguing me, is the Central Arctic Ocean um, has a so-called commercial fisheries agreement that's entered into force, and we have a 16-year moratorium on any commercial fishing development. And that agreement's been signed by China, the European Union, Japan, Korea, and the Arctic states. And I'm really interested to see how that agreement holds up and whether if ice continues to retreat or disappear, if waters continue to warm and acidify, whether in my lifetime, and again, remember where I am in my lifespan, in my lifetime, 
we see something that I would never have believed would have been possible as a child, which is commercial fishing in and around the North Pole. I grew up with a vision of the Arctic as this kind of frozen winter wind wonderland, uh, childish vision of the Arctic, and actually in my lifetime, coming, coming to grips with an Arctic that is so radically different, it's at times mind-blowing. Seth Klaus Dotz, Professor of Geopolitics at the Royal Holloway University of London. Klaus, thank you very much for your time, for your insightful thoughts and remarks about the geopolitics of Arctic. I think it's a fascinating topic to research, so I also hope that this episode will prompt more researchers to get into the topic. I wish you good luck with your research, uh, with writing articles and books, and I wish you also lots of energy because this topic is very complex. Thank you again for being our guest on the Thinker. Thank you again. See you later.